Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. When President Biden walks into the White House on his first day in office, you can be fairly sure that China will be at the top of his foreign policy briefing list, and the word Taiwan is likely to be underlined in red. China's Premier Xi Jinping has made it very clear he wants to see the island nation come under Beijing's authority while he is still in power. Today, we have two experts to explore the risks posed to the region by that policy and whether or not it could lead to full-blown military conflict. Oriana Schuyler Maslow is a fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. Hello, Oriana. You're there. I think you're in the dark, but we can hear you. That's the main thing. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and we also have Professor Steve Tsang, who is the director of the SOAS China Institute, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Hello, Steve. Hello, Nicholas. Just to start with, let, let's start with you, Steve. I thought it might be useful to get a recap of US-Chinese relations under the Trump administration these past four turbulent years. Can you just give us an overview? Um, I guess that the trade war is the thing that we've got foremost in our minds. Yes, of course. The four years of Donald Trump has made some basic changes to US-China relations. At the end of the Obama administration, even though Obama was the president who had a policy of pivot back to Asia, uh, Obama, in fact, was very willing to work with the Chinese government. And therefore, relationship were, in fact, rather good. Now, even though the Chinese government's policy and approach towards the United States hasn't really changed fundamentally, but with Trump in the White House and using the kind of language that he used, he was able, in fact, to change the way how the Americans look at China. And then we had COVID-19. And whatever the Chinese government said, very few people in the world, particularly in, United, in the United States, believe that COVID-19 did not start in China, whether it actually started in Wuhan or somewhere else, it started somewhere in China. And the very aggressive way the Chinese government tries to change that narrative very much added to the kind of negative feelings a lot of Americans have about China. So what we have now is a basic change in the views of the American establishment and the American general public about China. From at the end of the Obama administration, when it was still looking at cooperating or working with China in some ways, working on the kind of belief starting all the way back from Nixon, that China will eventually change, China will modernize, America will help it to do so. And when China has done so, China would become more like us, the Americans, the United States. Okay, and, and before, before COVID, of course, there was this trade war and, and really a, a rapid deterioration in relations, the Trump White House putting tariffs on Chinese goods and that, and that really was um, a, a, a rupture in, in that trading relationship. Well, the trading relationship was certainly a very major issue. Um, it certainly uh, soured the relationship and they could not really agree to a kind of uh, new trading relationships that both sides were, were happy with. And with that, by 2019, we had Donald Trump talking about a kind of economic decoupling with China. Right. OK, well, let, let's now switch. Let's focus a bit more. That gives us some of the, the context over the last four years. And we can talk more about these issues as we uh, through through the hour. But let's now look more closely at Taiwan and the relationship with Taiwan and also the South China Sea. Uh, we're going to bring in Oriana here as well. Um, let's have a look. Let's bring we've got some slides for people to look at so we can get the geography right. Um, uh, and and this is this is the South China Sea. Oriana, do you want just to, to step in here? Um, we, when we look at this, um, we we wonder why China is expanding so far southwards. And I know in, in the next slide, we're going to be looking at possibly some of the reasons why. But can you just talk about um, China's expansion over the past decade into this region, Oriana? 
Sure. So when you say their expansion, I just want to be clear, that's sort of a military expansion because the Chinese position has been for quite some time that the South China Sea is theirs. So if you look at the discourse and the rhetoric for decades, they have said that they have sovereignty over the South China Sea. And I don't want to bore your listeners with a bit too much of the legal detail of this. So I'll just kind of go through it very briefly. But basically what China says is that their claims are in accordance with international law because they claim some of these islands in the South China Sea. You can see from the map, the Paracels and the Spratlys. Um, but then they say that those Paracels and Spratlys should be treated as island groups, which means you can't sail between them. And then they say, the territorial sea should be measured from the outside of that island group. And then they say the exclusive economic zone should be measured from that. And while other countries say you have a right to measure or you have a right to exploit economic, um, uh, you know, like oil, gas, and things like that within your economic zone, China says you can regulate all activity. And so it's through this kind of abuse of international law that China has claimed the whole South China Sea. Now, uh, militarily, it's only been since maybe 20, in the past five years that uh, they've built the islands there, 3,200 acres there, put military forces on some of those islands, and have the ability more and more to project power in the South China Sea. So that's okay. what's relevant. Oriana, I think you've got your hands full. I know you've got competing demands. Uh, so just, just for this, the, we're going to bring up the next slide here. And, and just to, um, Steve, we're going to bring you in here, just to give some perspective. Um, th this red line here is called the first island chain. And I think this helps in a way also to explain um, to China's strategic overview of the area. Can you explain a bit further, Steve? Yes, the first island chain is very important to China. It's a relatively new concept for the Chinese. Um, China, as we know it, the People's Republic of China was founded by Mao Zedong in 1949 at the conclusion of the Chinese Civil War. And all through Mao's time until he died in 1976, China's strategic concept was one of so-called people's war, which means that if China were to be facing an external threat, you lure the enemy deep into the inside of China, close them, then destroy them. And that's what it was. From the 1980s onward, they started to have this modernization of China along the coastal regions. Now we are seeing the Chinese Eastern Coast Board as one of the most developed parts of the world. And therefore the entire defense concepts changed from the land-based people's war to a forward maritime defense line. And the first island chain is their preferred defense position in the first instance so that no enemies, seaborne enemies, could threaten China's seaboard and its vital sea lanes. And here you can see uh, in the middle is Taiwan. So Taiwan has now become what the Chinese used to like to quote from General Douglas MacArthur, an unsinkable aircraft carrier. When MacArthur used that in the context of the Korean War in 1950, he was using it to describe Taiwan as an unsinkable aircraft carrier if it were under the control by a power hostile to the United States for launching operation against American defense lines further into the Pacific. Now the Chinese are completely reversed and see Taiwan as the unsinkable aircraft carrier for the vital security of China. And that explains why Taiwan is so important to China. Now, th this expression was, was new to me, and I've only just been reading about it. And um, I see that John Foster Dulles, back in 1951, referred to this uh, first island chain as a, as a way of um, encircling um, communist China. So it was a, a line of um, encirclement, you know, a, a, a line of attack, if, 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 poss uh, if, um, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and it, it's, you know, China's looking at this in a different way defensively. I mean, maybe, um, I presume you know about, you know far more about that than, than I do. And Nicholas, can I just chime in here on the, the aircraft carrier issue uh, about Taiwan, uh, only because military technology has changed significantly 
since those comments were made by the United States and by China. Um, I think now we tend to refer to this strategy as like a counter intervention strategy. So of course it's defensive in that China wants to be able to use military force without um, the United States getting involved. And so they are going to be potentially defending against the United States, but the only scenario that occurs is if they've used force first. And nowadays, the biggest issue with that first island chain is China's ability to basically destroy any, anything within that area. And that includes US air bases in Japan and Korea, for example. So Taiwan these days, because of precision guided munitions, whether it's the United States, whether it's China, having bases in Taiwan is no longer sufficient to be able to project power to what we call the second island chain, which is the waters um, to the east of Taiwan. Um, so strategically, militarily, it doesn't have the same power that it did back in the 50s and 60s. But of course, China still wants to reunify, I think largely for political reason. Yeah. Um, but that is correct. Um, but for the Chinese, they don't have the capabilities to hold the second island chain, which is what they would have prefers to be able to do if they could. I mean, what they would ideally want is to have the Pacific Island, be, Pacific Ocean being divided between the Americans on one side and the Chinese on the other side, right in the middle of it. If they actually have Taiwan and they can move their missiles from the coast on to Taiwan, they're extending their range quite a bit into the Pacific, which will enable their capacities to host the first island chain as the, the, the second island chain, which at the moment, they simply do not have the capabilities to do so. They have the capability to hold the first, but not the second. Okay. Now, the thing I wanted to highlight here was the shift in the balance of power in within the region over the last 10 years. And if we can bring up the next slide, um, I think most people have know will, will be somewhat aware of China's expansion and creation of bases in the Spratly Islands. But that has, at the same time, taken place, as Oriana says, with the development in Chinese weapons technology. So China has the ability to strike um, bases or aircraft carriers with, with a new range of um, uh, are they hypersonic missiles or they're, they're a new range of missiles, Oriana? Can you just talk about that briefly? Right. So you probably hear a lot about hypersonics, Nicholas, and that's a very sort of sexy term. It's emerging technology. It just means they're even faster than the previous missiles that China had. Um, they don't have hypersonic missiles yet, but the important thing is uh, the United States can't defend against the current ballistic and cruise missiles that China has. So they actually don't need to be hypersonic um, to be a problem. The issue is that one, China has a quantity of missiles that you know has never been seen before. So any missile defense technology can be saturated. Uh, and second, they're extremely accurate uh, and uh, extremely lethal. So this is one of the biggest issues is uh, that China can basically hold US basing at risk. And so if we had to defend Taiwan, for example, it, it would be very difficult to have persistent fires over the Taiwan Strait if we can't you know, have aircraft flying from Japan. There's no way we can do it from the second island chain. It's just too far. But when you talk about the South China Sea, this is a huge area, right? This is the size of the continental United States. And so actually the United States has many more advantages here than they would in a Taiwan contingency because China can't project power over those distances like the US can. They don't have those experiences. Now you mentioned the island buildup, and this is a huge issue because before that map, you don't see it now, but that map looked like how it did, uh, as you see it, all blue skies, right? The United States could fly wherever it wanted to fly and have no threats to it. You put air defense systems on all those islands, you can show a separate map of those threat rings. Now the whole South China Sea is covered in air defense systems that threaten US aircraft. And so while people might point to the size being small of those islands, you know, it really has a huge operational effect. And we do know that China has been you know, using those islands for their Navy and their Coast Guard to increase their presence uh, in those waters to harass other claimants and as such. So it really does have an operational impact that they now have those bases there. Okay, we're going to come on to the next slide now, which is <clears throat> looks at um, this is um, from the um, Taiwan Taiwanese Ministry of Defense, 
and it refers to um, a People's Liberation Army uh, naval operation in September this year. It, it, there's a diagonal line between uh, mainline China and um, Taiwan, um, going from the top right down to the um, bottom left, um, and that's the the sort of maritime the, the the line of division between uh, down the Taiwan Straits. Um, th this this is. Um, Saber rattling. I mean, do do we really do we honestly think that Ty that uh, that China would actually risk a military invasion of Taiwan, Oriana? So it depends on the timeline. Uh, right now, uh, if it's their choice, no. Their military started going um, under some major reforms in 2013. They're not done yet. Um, so I think they probably want to wait a few more years, if possible. Of course, if Taiwan declares independence or something like that, it all goes out the window. But if they can wait, they will. I think it's incorrect, though, to think about sort of China's unwilling to fight a war more broadly. Just imagine if you're Xi Jinping. If you fight that war and in the end you reunify with Taiwan, but not only that, you beat the United States militarily, that's a huge benefit on two accounts. So I think, you know, people tend to underestimate the benefits that he sees from a military campaign at some point during his tenure. Right. Okay. And Steve, can you talk a bit more about that? I mean, is this something that um, Xi Jinping has, how does he express it when he talks about um, China, sort of Taiwan being coming back under Chinese control? What, what, what are the, how does he express it in what terms? And does he give some kind of time frame as well? Xi Jinping basically says that Taiwan will have to be under Chinese control before he hands over power to whoever his successor will be. Now, the saving grace here is that Xi Jinping has abolished term limits to being leader of China. And he is only 67. So he can afford to wait for, say, another 20 years uh, before he has to get Taiwan under Chinese control. He would prefer to use intimidation and force Taiwan to negotiate for terms, in which case the Americans would not have a basis to interfere. They would not need to take the risk of a military uh, invasion of Taiwan. But ultimately, he will have to calculate that the, if the Taiwanese do not play ball, he will have to use force and the use of force will require both deterring the Americans from uh, coming into the assistance of Taiwan, which the Americans have a kind of obligation under the Taiwan Relations Act of 1992, and at the same time to have the capacities to put boots on the ground on Taiwan. Therefore, amphibious assault would ultimately be necessary, but they would prefer not to have to do that sort of things. And that's, I think, where uh, Oriana is right that at the moment, in the foreseeable few years, it is extremely unlikely that the Chinese will want to uh, take that risk because they simply are not quite ready for that. But when they feel they are ready in 10 to 20 years time, I think on current trajectory, yes, we are going to be looking at the Chinese government ultimately using force over Taiwan. Okay, well, thank you both very much. It's been a really good um, introduction to this. I'm going to start um, bringing in questions. If everyone wants to start um, putting questions in the Q and A box here on the on the bottom left hand side, um, and then we can open up microphones. I've got lots of more, lots more questions. Um, the the first thing at the front of my mind is um, how is the new administration going to engage with um, with China, and what do you both think? And Oriana, what would you advocate? What do you see, seek from a Biden administration? I mean, it was fairly chaotic under Trump. Um, what, what do you think is going to be different? And what would you like them to do, Oriana? Yes, that's a great question. And I should uh, mention that I wrote an op-ed on, on this issue that just came out a couple of hours ago on how Biden's going to be uh, different on Taiwan than Trump. So if anyone is interested, they can just Google me and, and foreign policy. But I think the bottom line is, you know, people worry that Biden is going to be soft on Taiwan, right? People have argued that Trump has been a great defender of Taiwan and its defense. And it's true, right? We've seen huge arm packages, including that 16s going to Taiwan. Trump has been much more willing to have high level visits and other kind of bilateral means of, of communication between China and the United States. But I argue my op-ed that, you know, Trump did this because he can only rely on unilateral ways of helping Taiwan. 
but Taiwan really needs to improve its international space because what China is fearful of is horizontal escalation, what the world will think of them, not necessarily what the United States will think of them. And it was very hard for Trump to push for more international space for Taiwan. For example, you know, the World Health Organization, the World Health Assembly, uh, you know, Paris Climate Change Agreements, when the United States pulled out of these arrangements themselves and when the United States has bad relations with some countries in the region. So I think Trump is actually gonna, you know, Biden is actually gonna be in a better position to help Taiwan build resiliency. And, and those arms sales, everything else is going to continue. I think the difference is Biden isn't gonna try to poke China in the eye about it. They'll keep it quiet. Just this week, for example, we heard the Marines are going to exercise with Taiwan. You know, exercises between the two countries has happened this whole time. But publicizing them is what's unheard of. So I think the Biden administration is going to try to be a bit more diplomatic about it and focus on substance over symbolism. Um, Steve, I, I expect you'd echo, echo that. The thing that I um, struggle, which I'm amazed by in, in a way, is um, China is um, you know, economically dominant within the world. Um, I, I would have thought, in a way, some, a military conflict would be something that would be keen to avoid because it would jeopardize its huge um, sort of commercial advantage. Yet at the same time, we're seeing you know, in Hong Kong and within uh, Xinjiang that, that the Chinese are pretty willing to do things as they wish. I mean, is, is that, how, how do they balance the two things from Beijing's perspective? How do they view it? I think from their perspective, it's fairly easy. Um, who is pushing back over Hong Kong? Rhetorics, yes. But who is doing what about Hong Kong? Who is doing anything about Xinjiang? I mean, what we are seeing happening in Xinjiang is really, truly horrific. Um, if we use the definition that the United Nations use of genocide or crime against humanity, then over Xinjiang, the choice is which is a better definition to describe what is happening over there. Now, if this is what we are looking at, and we are not doing very much about it, mm. why should the Chinese government be too worried about it? Taiwan is that it's a different calculation because if you, if you're talking about a, um, a military conflict, that's a, something all, altogether different. Well, at the moment, um, if we are looking at something happening today, the Americans may not be getting so many, so much support from American allies at the moment. I think that is the really big change between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. A Biden administration would be much more able to work with America's democratic allies. And if we are looking at a situation of a potential conflict between China and the United States over Taiwan, I think we will be looking at America's uh, NATO and other allies coming in, not implying that they would deploy forces to the Taiwan Strait, but they were coming in to black, backfill American forces deployed worldwide for American forces elsewhere to be redeployed to their Indo-Pacific command for forward deployment in support of their operations. Uh, if we are looking at an event of the United States and China in a military conflict. We are looking at a, at the moment, near peer competition. And in 10, 20 years time, potentially a peer competition environment. We are going to be looking at substantial losses on both sides. Yeah, I mean, I, it just seems to me that the price commercially, you know, in terms of the economy would be too high, but um, uh, um, what, what's my to know? Let's, br let's bring in, um, uh, in, in some questions. Marty Ryan, please, Marty, go ahead. What is the political and economic influence that China has on Taiwan today? I'm familiar with the relationship between China and Hong Kong, but I'm not as familiar with the relationship between China and Taiwan. Steve, do you want to take that first? Absolutely. Well, at any one time, uh, Taiwan is a country of about 23 million people. At any one time, there is at least 1 million Taiwanese working and living on the mainland of China. And sometimes uh, people speculate and say that it could be nearly as high as 2 million. But I think a million is about uh, fairly uh, accurate and conservative calculation. China is Taiwan's single most important economic partner. 
and therefore um, China does have a lot of leverage that it can put on Taiwan. But those leverage are not enough to get Taiwan to do what Beijing wants. Taiwan is a full democracy. And if you look at the Freedom House uh, Index of how uh, strong each democracy is, Taiwan is sort of in the lower middle compa in comparison to most European countries and higher than the United States in terms of its degree of democratization and effectiveness of its democracy. And people in a democracy just will not accept uh, living under a very hard authoritarian system like they have in China. I think a comparison I would say is that if you've been watching um, color television, you wouldn't want to go back to black and white. And therefore, the Taiwanese simply won't play ball, even though China has a lot of leverage. Okay. Um, Paul Jackson. Paul Jackson in the UK, if you just open your microphone. There you go, Paul. Go ahead, Paul. I can't hear you, Paul. I don't know why. It may, it may be um, a problem with your um, computer audio. So I'm going to ask, I can see your question, so I'm going to ask it for you. Um, and this will put to Oriana. Does CETO have a role in defending Taiwan? Oriana. Well, I think uh, Professor Tseng, you know, put it very diplomatically when he said, you know, maybe European countries, for example, this is NATO, but just to, to open up to the question, uh, you know, they might take out more responsibilities in Europe to free up U.S. forces. The bottom line is no one's going to be helping the United States uh, defend Taiwan. And CETO definitely has no role. It has no role because, first of all, you know, it doesn't, it's not a part of of uh, the, the arrangement, there is no sort of uh, obligations there. But also even our allies, they don't have an obligation to defend our other allies. You know, we don't have a situation like in NATO where Asian countries are linked in the defense of each other. I mean, we're at the point now where, you know, the United States might not even be able to use its own forces in Japan to defend Taiwan. You know, we're in constant negotiations with the Japanese on that issue. And so, the United States is going to be fighting this alone. Uh, the question is, you know, can other countries support in different ways by putting diplomatic pressure on China, by, Nicholas, as you mentioned, you know, putting economic costs on China. But operationally, you know, even if CETO did have some sort of obligation, the militaries involved in those countries are so s small and backwards, they wouldn't really be of help. What the United States needs is access. That's what the United States needs. It needs countries in the region to allow U.S. forces to base and operate from their country. And that's very risky because then they become a target of Chinese aggression during wartime. But the bottom line is that's what the United States really needs to prevail in a conflict because China might be willing to attack U.S. bases in Japan if that basically ends the ability of the United States to defend Taiwan. But if the United States had a, could operate from bases all over the region in many different countries, you know, we have this phrase in the military, you know, uh, places, not bases. It doesn't have to be permanent, but, but a place that you could have logistics, you could have weapon systems. China can't attack every country in the region. And so this is really what I think the U.S. military is working towards, is having these types of agreements so that more countries will allow the United States to access their territory in these conflicts. And so Ariana, hopefully even countries military, in Southeast Asia will military do military strategist, you do have to think the unthinkable, but do you really think that China would attack U.S. bases <laughs> in Japan within, within you know, um, the foreseeable future, five, ten years? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. So if so, if China... China, of course, this is all subsidiary dependent. If China, for whatever reason, thinks it's not the point where he can take Taiwan by force, Xi Jinping, maybe he's maybe he's getting more nostalgic in his old age, what have you. He, you know, he wants to do it. Uh, the only way he can guarantee a win is if the United States can't fight back, um, and if they think that the United States will definitely be involved. Now, there's an argument to be made if they are not sure of U.S. involvement. Maybe they don't attack the bases at first because they're hoping to keep the U.S. out. But if the United States has done its job to credibly signal its, its willingness to defend Taiwan, if China is convinced the United States is going to come to Taiwan's aid, then you, you have to attack those bases because that's where the forces are flowing from. 
Uh, so I think that's definitely a possibility. And it's something that, you know, Chinese military strategists talk about quite extensively. And if you look at the range of their systems, where they're positioned, um, it really gives you the indication that they have those bases uh, in Japan in their eyesight. Okay. Um, Diane Cook, you've got a question. Diane Cook in the UK. Yeah, I'm unmuted, yes? Yeah, yeah, you're there, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, quite ties in, I think, with Oriana, your last comments in a way, because looking at the map of the um, first and second island chains, it's amazing what countries are actually included within that, as it were, on the Chinese side of that line. Um, and I was most taken with Korea, really. Um, that you could see if assuming the Communist Party remains in power, um, can one see that actually, you know, Taiwan first, um, Korea next, maybe Japan after that? There, there are multiple ways of expanding this. I mean, you could look at the Belt and Road Initiative and how ports have been built by Chinese workforces, money has been lent uh, to governments, and when those governments can't pay, uh, China takes over the port. Um, so it doesn't have to be through sort of military force. I mean, uh, Oriana, it's quite possible for them to expand, and they are expanding their military bases and their sort of strategic area of dominance. Right. And if I can just highlight, I, I had an article in Foreign Affairs um, about a year and a half ago in which I made this argument that all successful rising powers build and exercise power differently. Right. We always look at China and we try to look, are they doing what the United States is doing? But the United States, you know, when it rose, it, it did things differently than Great Britain, right? It didn't build a colonial empire. Instead, it built, uh, it built international institutions and a global power projection network. And so China's preference is to dominate the region militarily, but not really to dominate the world militarily. I think it prefers to rely on political and economic tools uh, to be able to ensure uh, that it has the power to shape decisions in capitals all over the world. Uh, but, but just to the question, I do want to be clear, again, that China, I don't think, has the goal of occupying any other area besides Taiwan. Right? I think even today, if, you, if we wanted to avoid a war with China, we gave China Taiwan, the South China Sea, East China Sea, you know, that would be the end of it. It's not like tomorrow they'd say, hey, you know, we want to take Tokyo. But they do want to have the dominant influence over those countries, and Korea is a perfect example. They want Korea outside the orbit of the United States, and that includes, you know, abrogating the treaty with the United States and pulling U.S. forces off the peninsula. That obviously for them is an Everest goal. It's not something that's going to happen anytime soon, but their goals in their immediate region, I think, are different than their goals farther out. Even those ports that Nicholas mentioned, they could turn commercial ports into military ports, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, and if they do start moving in that direction, they do have to make significant infrastructure changes. We'll see it. So, so it is possible that they're just going to use those for commercial influence, and we won't see naval bases, for example, throughout the Indian Ocean. They do have one naval base now in Djibouti, but even that base is very different than U.S. bases, right? It doesn't have, you know, offensive power projection. Uh, capabilities in the same way the U.S. ones do. So I like to keep an open mind of what their posture beyond the region is going to look like. I think it's still an open question. Uh, Oriana, I'm amazed by your soundtrack. Um, behind <laughs> you, I think you're now in a forest with wild birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we so so to, to uh, not wake the toddler, me and the newborn are sitting outside under a tree. And that's why you hear the birds. Uh, it's a very delicate balance, you know, having two kids under two. It's kind of like, you know, US one China policy, yeah, right? Yeah. Try to deter China and not embolden uh, Taiwan at the same time. I'm living, I'm living this balance every day. Who's China and who's Taiwan, yeah. Steve, can, can just to follow it up, what, what are your thoughts on what Ariana was just saying, but also the, the question about how China is expanding its power? I think actually we, we, we need to go back to Taiwan. Right. Um, the other ambitions are pretty academic. If China gets Taiwan in spite of the Americans Taiwan Relations Act, no country in East Asia, from Japan down to the whole of Southeast Asia, will trust the American guarantee of security. That will be completely gone. The entire Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States would have collapsed. There's no need in that scenario, there's no need for China to 
use force against any of the other countries in Southeast Asia or Korea. Um, it will not use force against Korea anyway, because if which Korea will China invade? North Korea with nuclear weapons and a leader who prob probably is more willing to use nuclear weapons on China than on the United States? Or South Korea, which have to bypass an ally which is not an ally. So that's very much academic. And both Korea will then have to do what China wants, as will be the case of Southeast Asia and for that matter, Japan, which is also why, in fact, I disagree with uh, Orient, uh, Oriana on, on Japan. I think if we are looking at a scenario of China and the United States going to war over Taiwan, whatever problems that the Japanese have with the Americans will be thrown out of the windows. Then the Japanese will go in and help the Americans in so far as their constitutions allow them to do so. Uh, because they cannot afford to see that basic change. They are very, very conscious of that. Right, okay. Fascinating. Um, Lois Tower, who's in Australia. Go ahead, Lois. Hey, uh, it's morning here. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is on climate change. And also it leads on, I've done a fair bit of, okay, being an Aussie, uh, an older Aussie, we're familiar with particularly the Indochina war and the wars of Southeast Asia. And it's the whole difference. Firstly, to what degree is climate change going to be the elephant in the room? You're now getting another cyclone, uh, sorry, typhoon going through the Philippines. There's another one forming over the north, it looks like forming over the north of uh, PNG. And this is basically in late November. Um, so when you're looking at it, the climate is going to be very distinctly different than it was, say, for the last 30 years. And that is going to impact on military operations. The second one that you're looking at is China's looking at this ability to project power through military might from a distance. That is very different from fighting a guerrilla warfare on the ground. And therefore, to invade Taiwan, they're assuming that they can take the whole island and not have a guerrilla war. If they do start getting that protracted war, um, it then gets onto their ability to basically fight that. And there's, there's other issues tied up in that as well. So it's a combination of military warfare strategies and what actually ends up happening on the ground. I just wondered how you guys were you know, looking at that playing out. And also through the final comment, and remember China's got an army full of only children. Politically, it's not desirable to run around bumping off everybody's only child. Um, and that war would have to be then back home, very politically palatable. Okay, Lois, just to un unpack that a bit, just on the first one, are you saying actually, are you saying that climate change is an obstacle to an invasion? Are you saying that it's just it's so destabilizing, it's difficult to, to invade countries anymore? I'm not quite clear on it's, that one. It's, no, it's throwing the calculations out. Right. You know, it's basically, if you're assuming that you can basically hold territory or project military power on the basis of that the weather will stay the same, but for example, these Spratly Islands, you know, when you get a typhoon surge going through, that could be several metres. They're not very high islands. So you've got those issues in there as well. Yeah. OK, well, let, so Oriana... There's let, a whole let, combo of issues in there. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I've been to both China start. and um, uh, Taiwan, and I've got friends in both countries. Yeah. OK, let's let's get both Oriana and Steve on this, and let's try and get some, some fairly quick answers. Oriana? Sorry, after the climate change one, just reminding me, Lois, what's the what was the so second it, question? It, the idea of, you know, taking the country, um, Taiwan. Oh, the guerrilla war. Uh, guerrilla warfare. I right. mean, right. I mean, it's a mountainous country. How do you invade it? How do you occupy it? And then the last, the, the, the other point yeah. is that is China really willing to lose tens of thousands? Oh, the of one tap. Right, right. So I will say. So first of all, Lois, those birds you hear are Coogee birds. I'm in Sydney, so uh, okay. so we're both in Australia. Uh, so climate change, you know, absolutely, the military takes into account these weather patterns when it does any sort of operations. That's why you see, for example, a higher operational tempo over the summer for China and then less of an operational tempo the rest of the year. Same with the United States. We can't do any of this during a typhoon. So, so if, if these sort of patterns become more frequent, then you have smaller windows of opportunity for conflict. In terms of guerrilla warfare, uh, I don't think China's taken into account for two reasons. The first is if you look at the Taiwan military uh you know they're having they have trouble recruiting they don't really seem to have a martial spirit the average citizen doesn't have military training anymore since they've gotten rid of um 
mandatory training. And guerrilla warfare is difficult when you're trying to maintain like a semblance of protection of human life and international law. The times where it's worked is when, you know, people just engage in massacres. And I think what we know about China is they're willing to do that. And so I think they have a lot of domestic repression experience. Their budget to repress the Chinese people is larger than their military budget. So while we're talking about military modernization and their military capabilities, they're actually better at the sort of uh, suppression of people aspect than they are of projecting uh, military power. And the one China policy, I will say, Lois, like I've asked this of the Chinese military so many times. It's a huge unknown. They, t I mean, what I hear from them is, you know, Taiwan is the ultimate prize. There's so much nationalism and pride over this issue that people are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, and it wouldn't be. Um, uh, unpopular domestically as long as China wins. But this is something I think we don't really know. And it's probably something Xi Jinping doesn't know as well. Steve, what's your take on that? Those, those same questions. Well, I'll do it in the reverse order. I think the one child policy, I'm very much with um, Oriana. I don't think the Chinese government uh, thinks too much about it. Uh, Xi Jinping's perspective is a very simple and straightforward one. The PLA is the party's army. And the party's army does what the party asks it to do. Uh, the PLA is not China's national defense forces. And people in China have been fully indoctrinated to think that Taiwan is a sacred territory of China and therefore must be liberated at all costs. Um, so I don't think he would be too worried about that. Uh, that. A lot of that propaganda may be problematic, but if people buy into it, then that's what it really matters. I think the prospect of guerrilla warfare in Taiwan, I don't think they really think very much about it. I mean, they are planning for ultimately having to use um, potentially landing on Taiwan, but their calculation is that if, if and when they are prepared to use four, they have all the big forces ready, but they will be going in with missile strikes and special forces attack. They will take over the presidential palace in Taiwan and the main control and command centers in Taiwan, basically cut off Taiwan's government head, force whatever comes up next to negotiate for peace, and that's the end of it. And then the big PLA forces can land um, with, without necessarily having to do a Normandy-type landing. And Taiwan, therefore, would be fairly straightforward and easy to sort out. Um, the climate change, I think, again, is something that uh, the military will be thinking about very much in the ways that uh, Oriana, I think, has beautifully put it. Xi Jinping? Uh, well, he, he does kind of take climate change seriously now because he wants this to be part of his legacy. But dealing with environmental issue is a bit of a second thought for the uh, Chinese government. It has been for a long time. Okay. Um, I do want more questions, um, and I'm going to. I know I can see some great names here used to um, asking questions, so please, please go ahead and tap away. Steve, I do want to come back to that question. What is the economic cost to China of launching a war in, in Taiwan? If in the end China ends up having to fight a war on Taiwan, it will be catastrophic. Um, it will be catastrophic not only for Taiwan for obvious reasons, it will economically be catastrophic for. For China, even if they win, if they lose, we are not looking at just at economic uh, costs. We are looking at political costs. We are looking at the government led by Xi Jinping potentially uh, being challenged. Um, even though most of the uh, America's Democratic Airlines will not want to be uh, sending forces in support of Taiwan, mm. uh, the capacity of the US to get them to get into some kind of economic sanctions, I think is fairly high. And that's why the economic cost to China would actually be quite significant, not to say the element of disruptions to uh, seaborne and other trade and resupplies of uh, material, minerals and other essential supplies to China. The Chinese economy is actually more open and dependent on external trade than the United States economy is. Right. So uh, if they fully calculate that, I think they would, they, they, they would not want to, to do that. Where we have a problem is the policy making system in China. 
Mm. If the top leader, Xi Jinping, says, we are going to take Taiwan, which minister in economic portfolios or which general or admiral or air marshal will dare to say, but sir, you don't really want to do that. The costs are too high. They will simply say, yes, sir. When would you like it to be done? Yeah. Let, let's. One of the things I've read about is the, the possibility of a cock-up. We know that Saddam Hussein uh, invaded Kuwait because he thought the United States was going to turn a blind eye. Um, the US has had a, a, a policy of um, def defending Taiwan, but being quite opaque about it. Um, it could, Oriana, do you see the possibility of, of some kind of cock up, some kind of um, China thinking, OK, um, the US is not that interested, we can do something about it? So I think maybe a decade or two ago, the main consideration was whether the United States would get involved, right? It was about US willingness to fight because if the United States was willing to fight, China would lose. But now that's no longer the dominant calculus because the Chinese military is so advanced that now it is, I've talked to Chinese military members who say that even if the United States does fight, they think they might be able to win. So this is where I think the miscalculation now lies. The US conventional deterrent against China is weakening. The United States needs to show that it is capable of defending Taiwan. And the miscalculation could be that China thinks, uh, you know, oh, well, the United States no longer has the capability to really prevail, so let's go for it. And so that's really what the problem is. And I will just say on the economic costs, I'm not so sure China, I'm not so sure the costs would be catastrophic, to be honest. I think it depends on the scenario. China has been using so much of its power and its leverage to convince the world that Taiwan is unique. Right, that how they treat Taiwan is not how they treat anyone else. And I think they could argue that they were provoked somehow. For example, right now with the Trump administration, you know, sending high level you know, people to Taiwan, I think they could try to shape the narrative to make it unclear so that countries aren't willing to economically sanction them. And even though sanctions, you know, aren't gonna last forever. And what we know from history is countries are willing to pay the economic costs for, you know, for the sake of their, their interests or their security. So um, I, don't, I just don't know. It could also be a very short war, and therefore the economic costs in terms of disruptions wouldn't be uh, very high either. Steve, that raises a really um, interesting question, which is there might be a point at which the United States recognizes its limitations. If we use Afghanistan as an example, one might say that that was a, a, a conflict that couldn't be won and shouldn't have been fought. Could uh, a war over Taiwan be a conflict that couldn't be won and shouldn't be fought? No, we won't, we won't know. I think these sort of things we usually only know about it uh, with the benefit of hindsight. I would go back to uh, where I was earlier. That's the Americans' uh, approach to the East Asia region fundamentally was based on, they now call it the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy by slightly different names earlier on, which essentially was built at the end of the Second World War, mm. which has Japan as the cornerstone of the American strategy in that part of the world. And the Japanese are taking, looking at Taiwan so seriously that they, they will have to recognize that if they accept losing Taiwan, either by not giving Taiwan the support at the, uh, begin, at the beginning, or after some limited uh, military support and then say, okay, we've done as much as we can safely. Now we wash our hands. It's not worth us doing it any longer. They will be washing off Japan and the entire Indo-Pacific strategy. I think that is where the miscalculations can easily come in. There are good reasons for the Chinese government to miscalculate. Miscalculate in terms of whether the Americans have the wills to fight and whether the Americans have the sustaining powers to fight, whether the economic cost to China could be really so high. And if they calculate that all these are really not that high, then the willingness to use force uh, is higher. And likewise, the, um, the American calculations will, will have to depend a lot on the situation at the time when this happened. Um, if we're looking at a crisis being provoked by some actions on the part of the government in Taiwan, then I think the chance of the Americans coming into uh, Taiwan's assistance would be a lot smaller. But I really don't see any government, elected government in Taiwan, 
trying to choose something which will effectively be committing national suicide. Oriana. I'm sorry, Nicholas, can I just add one more miscalculation, which is the calculation of their own military capabilities, right? China hasn't fought a war since 1979. And one of the biggest areas of uncertainty that Xi Jinping talks about is the quality of his military forces. So while they can, you know, test technology and have fancy ships and everything, they don't know when push comes to shove how they're going to perform in a conflict. So that's also going to be something that they're going to have to learn about. But isn't that something that they will want to learn about and therefore you require conflicts in order to test out your forces, Oriana? Yes. <laughs> so it's something they, they're going to want to learn about before Taiwan. Though. So if they have control over the situation, I think, for example, my bets are on, you know, a small island campaign in the South China Sea, a potential naval skirmish against Vietnam, um, because, you know, they would definitely win because your first battle after spending all this money on your military, you have to win. The Chinese people are paying attention. But this is also where they can test out their joint operations capability. So for people on a call that don't have military background, something like Taiwan, taking Taiwan is, you know, you can do various things. As Steve mentioned, you prefer coercion, right? Lob a bunch of missiles over there until they give up. But you have to prepare for the amphibious assault. And that requires the Air Force, the Navy, Army, everyone to work together. And this is actually very difficult. And few countries can do it. The United States is one of the you know, few countries that can. So China has been reforming its whole organizational system for the past seven years to try to facilitate these types of joint operations and doing you know, realistic training, as they call it. But realistic training isn't warfare, as we know. So um, yeah, so I think, they're gonna, I think we're gonna see a little bit more aggression against smaller powers. And I would just agree completely with Steve that the issue with Taiwan is if, if Taiwan goes to China, the role, US leadership role in Asia is over. China is now the hegemon of Asia. And so in the United States, people are talking about, you know, do we really want to fight a war with China over Taiwan? It's just Taiwan or what have you. You know, it's about, you know, principles and also about what the United States sees its role in the world to be. Okay. We've got a question here from Paul Jackson. Paul's got a problem with his sound. And his question is, could, what about cyber warfare? What role could that have, Oriana? So, so cyber warfare can be a, go, a good coercive element, right? This goes in the category of lobbying the missiles, right? You impose costs on the other side until they give up. But cyber can't hold territory. And so it, you, still, you still kind of need some traditional military forces because in the end, um, it, basically what this does is it imposes costs on the other side, but you can't win the war just with it. And, and I'm very skeptical that I think China would absolutely use some cyber tools, but just like the debate about nuclear weapons of whether to use them just against military facilities or civilian facilities, I'm very skeptical that China, for example, would use cyber tools against US civilians in a way that would you know, bring the war to the United States. Because one of the things is that the United States might have difficulty defending Taiwan because it's not our whole military against China's military, right? It is indo -PACOM against China's military. But if you start harming you know, US civilians at home, then you're gonna get the full force of the United States military. And China wants to avoid that. They wanna fight a war at the level and scope that they can win. And so I think of course, cyber is gonna be used to disrupt the flow of military operations, to you know, disrupt targeting, situational awareness, things like that. It will be used against maybe the people of Taiwan uh, but I am doubtful that it would be used against the people of the United States. I'll just add that the first and most significant use will be at the very, very beginning of the use of force in combination with the missile strike and special forces attack. I mean, cyber warfare will be used by the Chinese to cause so much disruption in Taiwan when they are doing the so-called decapitation operation, which will from their perspective, hopefully make it unnecessary to do a full-scale amphibian assault, which they know they are not ready by a very, very long way. Every single skirmish the Chinese have had um, in the last 30, 40 years, they have not done very well. The recent uh, skirmish with the Indians, where they are not using um, firearms, but cold, old-fashioned, homemade weapons. 
The reason why the Chinese would not release any figures about their casualties is probably because they suffer worse than the Indians have managed to. Right. Uh, that the question I have in my mind is about: Is the United States? Um, I mean, how does it? How does the United States stand at the moment vis-à-vis uh, -vis the uh, Chinese military capacity? Has has um, uh, is the U.S. still an overwhelming force in that region? It doesn't seem to be. If you look at the Spratly Islands, it doesn't seem to be in terms of the vulnerability of aircraft carriers and missile technology. What is the U.S. doing to compete with China, Oriana? So I think it depends on how we look at this because I teach a whole course on the Chinese military. And at the end of the course, I ask my students, what's the thing that surprised you the most? And they say how backwards and weak the Chinese military is because they hear, you know, even me talk about, you know, how they could potentially take Taiwan under certain scenarios about, you know, the, the Spratly Islands. And they think, you know, China's this huge force. The difference is that the United States, two things, the United States is not used to being held at risk, right? The United States, the last time an aircraft shot down a U.S. aircraft, I mean, maybe the Korean War, uh, you know, even with Afghanistan, you know, we fly around and sail around wherever we want to. And so China's ability to hold U.S. forces at risk is new and it's uncomfortable. Um, so that's sort of the first thing is we have kind of different standards. The United States, you know, might destroy 10 aircraft for every one aircraft they destroy of ours. The issue is that China is building a lot more than the United States and they might be willing to lose more than the United States. So that's sort of the first issue. And the second issue is we're not fighting the same war, right? China has a huge advantage, right? They're only 220 miles from Taiwan, right? They can rely on bases within China. They can rely on air defense systems within China to cover that strait. The United States is projecting power, you know, in some cases across the Pacific before we get to the fight. So it's kind of like a boxing match in which the United States has, you know, done a triathlon first. And so that's why sometimes comparing just force on force, you know, their aircraft, our aircraft, their aircraft carriers, our air, aircraft carriers, isn't very informative. It's really about the scenario. And the biggest issue for the United States is access. And China has, the, has all of, of China. And going to the cyber issue, you know, if there's cyber disruptions, China has redundancy in like cables under the ground. The United States is going to rely 100% on satellites, right? Because we need to communicate across vast distances. While China can have their command and control infrastructure, you know, also there are always landlines. Let's just put it that way if you can't get broadband. So they do have some more redundancies than the United States does that gives them an advantage in these particular conflicts. But that doesn't mean the Chinese military is close to the level of sophistication uh, of, the, of the US military. Okay. We're, we're, we've just got a few minutes left now, so we're wrapping up shortly. Steve, how do you see the next few years panning out? What do you expect from Biden? I know I've asked this in, um, uh, earlier on, but what, what are the first steps you expect to see from Biden? And, and um, uh, are you, have you, do, you, do you think they're going to be positive developments in terms of Taiwan security? Um, not in terms of Taiwan security. I think that tension is going to remain... Um, the Biden can be expected to be a lot more consistent and uh, rational in his approach towards China. But we have seen a across the board bipartisan hardening of views in the United States towards China. So it's very, very unlikely. I think it's practically impossible to, for a reversal or a turning of the clock back to the pre-Trump era. We're just not going to see that happened. Where I think um, with China, Biden might well be trying to work more with America's allies and perhaps also um, find some ways to rejoin TPP, uh, which would in fact be very uh, useful in countering the kind of things that the Chinese government is doing. Trump withdrawing from TPP was a godsend to, to China. Right. Oriana, what are your what are your expectations of the new administration? So I, I largely agree with that, though I think there's this view that Democrats and Republicans are kind of on the same page with China that misses some of the nuances. So, so just as a background, you know, I myself am a Democrat, but I work um, part time at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a very conservative think tank. So I feel like I have a little bit of insight into uh, both sides, even though both feel like we're in a competition with China. 
how they assess the nature of the threat and what to do about it is vastly different. For Republicans, China is an inherent threat because it's a communist autocratic regime. And therefore, the goal is to undermine China at every turn, undermine their power. That's not how the Democrats see it. I think the Democrats think that theoretically, you know, China and the United States don't have to be in this competition, but Xi Jinping has made some strategic decisions that has put our interests at odds. And so we don't want to undermine China per se. Uh, we want to you know, shape the way that they do things, prevent them from engaging in coercive, corrupt, and, and covert behaviors. But I think you're going to see Biden doing a lot less of just poking China in the eye for the sake of poking China in the eye. And that tone is going to change. And I think that's going to impact the bilateral relationship to a certain degree. So even though we're competing, and just to go back, you know, to something that was said earlier, I agree we're in a strategic competition. My main complaint about President Trump is he ensured that the United States was losing because we actually weren't competing in a lot of areas. And so I am more hopeful that President Biden is going to be more involved in the world, maybe in TPP, you know, better relations with the allies so that you know, the United States can actually give China a run for its money when it comes to exercising its power uh, everywhere. My hope is that they do maintain the hard military edge. Uh, I think President Obama was good at reassuring China uh, President Trump was good at credible threats, but we know deterrence requires both. So my hope is that the, the Biden administration combines the assurance aspect and the threats aspect to reestablish deterrence in the Asia Pacific. Well, Ariana, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and also to Professor Steve Tsang. We've run out of time. Um, my thanks to you both. It's been a fascinating discussion. Um, we just to look ahead to um, tomorrow for those of you who are going to be not tomorrow, I mean next week. Our next discussion is on Tuesday, the 17th of November at 10 p.m. GMT. And that's with Barbara Demick, who was the former LA Times bureau chief in Beijing. Her latest book is called Eat the Buddha, and it is about Tibet. And it's um, she's a, a brilliant author, and that will be a fascinating discussion. So following on from Taiwan, our, dis our next discussion really focuses on, on Tibet. L less about foreign policy, more about what's happened in Ch Tibet over the last uh, three decades or so, um, and longer. It should be a really interesting talk. Thank you again to Steve Tsang and to Oriana Skylamastro. Thank you both very much indeed.